And the song that's uh, selected for the end of this lesson is, I guess, appropriate for what we're going to talk about this morning, the cost of being a Christian. It is a costly thing. We have been uh, going through the Gospel of Luke in our Sunday morning lessons, and this morning we are in Luke chapter 14. This is part of the larger narrative describing Jesus' final journey to Jerusalem. And along this journey, Jesus has a number of things to say that are somewhat difficult. Uh, about how difficult discipleship is, about how much it's going to cost, about how there really uh, aren't going to be all that many people that are being saved, as we saw in chapter 13, because not everybody really wants it bad enough. They're not striving to enter. More to the point, in chapter 12, we saw warnings that we ought to be ready at all time because the Lord could come in judgment at any time. But now in chapter 14, we're going to see another... Uh, side of this, a very difficult and if some might say even unreasonable demand that Jesus makes. And that is this cost of being a Christian. The chapter is outlined, uh, I've decided simple was better on the outline and so we're going to look at two sections this morning. Uh, first is this banquet that Jesus goes to, one that involves people being rejected from the kingdom. And the other is this more uh, pointed section on the cost of discipleship. And everything in verses 1 through 24 takes place at a scene where Jesus gets invited to a dinner, a, perhaps a luncheon at the house of one of the Pharisees. So let's begin reading in chapter 14. Uh, I'm, I'm going to start in verse 1. It happened that when he went into the house of one of the leaders of the Pharisees on the Sabbath to eat bread, they were watching him closely. And there in front of him was a man suffering from dropsy. And Jesus answered and spoke to the lawyers and Pharisees, saying, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath or not? But they kept silent. And he took hold of him and healed him and sent him away. And he said to them, Which one of you will have a son or an ox fall into a well and will not immediately pull him out on the Sabbath day? And they could make no reply to this. The scene opens with another Sabbath healing. It seems like every time the Sabbath rolls around, Jesus is healing somebody. And every time He heals somebody on the Sabbath, people get upset because He's violating the sanctity of the sacred day, in their minds anyway. The Jews had taken the Sabbath and assigned to it so many traditions which were not in the Bible that they had turned the Sabbath into a day of bondage rather than what it was supposed to be. A day commemorating release from bondage. We saw a similar scene to this last week in chapter 13. Whenever a woman came into the synagogue on the Sabbath and she was bent over and doubled over and Jesus heals her and the synagogue leader says, there's six other days you could have done that. Why'd you have to, heal? Why'd you have to come get healed today? And Jesus exposes his hypocrisy. He says you would lead your animal to water and feed him on the Sabbath. Why wouldn't we help this person who is ill on the Sabbath? And the same thing is true here. In verse 5, Jesus makes the same argument. You would help an animal that fell into a pit. You would help your son if he fell into a pit. Why can't I help this child of Abraham? Why can't I help this man who is suffering from dropsy on the Sabbath day? The Sabbath was supposed to be a day of freedom. But the Pharisees had abused it and turned it into a day of oppression. But of course, this scene uh, sets the... Well, this. Sabbath healing sets the scene for what comes next as people are coming in for the dinner. All sorts of questions are being asked and Jesus begins telling parables and relating to the fact that they're at a feast. They're at a banquet. How is the kingdom of heaven like a banquet? Well, uh, it's based of course on this Old Testament imagery of feasting. The prophet Isaiah in Isaiah chapter 25 and verses 6 through 8 specify that the Lord will give the Lord of hosts will prepare a lavish banquet for all peoples on this mountain. A banquet of aged wine. Choice pieces with marrow and refined aged wine. And on this mountain he will swallow up the covering which is over all the peoples, even the veil which is stretched over all nations. He will swallow up death for all time. And the Lord God will wipe away tears from all faces and he will remove the reproach of his people from all the earth. For the Lord has spoken. In the prophet Isaiah, we see that the Lord had prepared a lavish feast and that the kingdom of God which was coming was to be equated to this lavish feast, to this banquet, a celebration prompted by the defeat of the Gentile nations. 
A celebration that accompanies the resurrection of the dead, the end of death itself. Of course, this great feast that is proclaimed in the kingdom is the basis for the Lord's Supper, which we eat on a regular basis. And uh, unfortunately, translation obscures in the Bible that the word for supper and dinner and banquet and feast are actually all the same term. Uh, when Paul talks about the Lord's Supper in 1 Corinthians 11, it's, you know, it's the, same, the word for supper is the same term that's translated banquet or feast everywhere else. Uh, so there, there's an important feature to realize. And in Luke chapter 22, Jesus promised to eat and drink with His people anew in the kingdom of God. The same image is revisited in the book of Revelation with another twist. Revelation chapter 19, all are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. But in verse 18 of that same book, we learn that the main course in that supper is the, a feast upon the very enemies of God themselves, accompanying the defeat of the beast and the resurrection of the dead. And all that to say, about all that feast imagery, Jesus appeals to this feast imagery to begin telling parables about how people ought to behave at this heavenly banquet. And the first question you ask any time you come to a dinner is, where am I going to sit? You know, well, sometimes your host has place cards out for you, but I don't think they had those at this particular feast. Uh, and in verses 7 through 11, Jesus begins addressing this very feature. He began speaking a parable to the invited guests when he noticed how they had been picking out the places of honor at the table, saying to them, When you are invited by someone to a wedding feast, do not take the place of honor, for someone more distinguished than you may have been invited by him. And he who invited you both will come and say to you, Give your place to this man, and then in disgrace you proceed to occupy the last place. But when you are invited, go and recline at the last place, so that when the one who has invited you comes, he may say to you, Friend, move up higher. And then you will have honor in the sight of all who are at the table with you. For everyone who exalts himself will be humble, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. Now, I don't think we, uh, we have this going on in our culture as much today. Uh, back, then, but back then, going to a dinner party was a way to kind of distinguish who was best. You know, there was always this subconscious question on everybody's mind. You know, who is the greatest in this group of people? That I'm currently with. Uh, and, you know, ancient people in particular, they would invite everybody over for dinner and they would give their friends the places of honor at the table and they would give their enemies the places of disgrace at the table. Uh, and, you know, inviting people to a dinner was a way of saying, I'm better than you and I can do this for you. Today, we don't really do that. If we don't like people, we just don't invite them. Uh, back then, they invited them and they gave them the last place at the table to say, I don't like you. Uh, so our, the culture has changed a little bit since then. But all that to say, when you get to the dinner or party, there may be a temptation on your part to say, hmm, you know, I want to be, I want to be kind of the top dog here, so I'm going to, I'm going to steal the place of honor for myself. And they pick out the place of honor for themselves at the table. And Jesus says, no, that's the wrong way to go about it. He says, and perhaps even appealing to their selfish side a little bit, he says, you should be picking the last place so that when the, um, the guy comes in and says, no, 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 you need to move up, then you look good in the sight of everybody else. You take a place of honor, and someone more distinguished than you shows up, someone who's better than you shows up, and you know they will, they're going to make you move. And then you're going to look silly. And you're going to be embarrassed in front of everybody. Is that what you want? Nobody likes to be embarrassed. But something is wrong at this feast that Jesus is at. Everybody is picking the places of honor at the table. It is short-sighted and foolish. That's the problem with the human race. We are all short-sighted. We want the best things now. We want the distinguishment now. We want to exalt ourselves now. The fundamental assumption is that we're better than everybody else now. But Jesus breaks that concept, that faulty idea of human honor. The real point, of course, is in verse 11. The spiritual principle that he makes. Everyone who, humble, who exalts himself is going to be humbled. And everyone who humbles himself will be exalted. He stated the same principle back in chapter 13 and verse 30. Behold, some who are last will be first, and some who are first will be last. Don't think you're better than everybody else because if your goal in life is to be the best, to look out for number one, to be the top uh, dog, the head honcho, there's a, there's another, you got another thing coming to you. The judgment of God, the reversals that God puts forth in the lives of people dictates that you will be humbled by that. God always, ex it is God's pattern to exalt those who have humbled themselves 
and to humble those who have exalted themselves. It's the very pattern of Jesus Christ. Jesus was greatest of all and He chose to become least of all. Willingly, He humbled Himself and submitted to death on the cross. And for that reason, God highly exalted Him and gave Him the name above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Philippians chapter 2. Jesus reiterates this principle to His disciples again at the Last Supper. Humans are interested in self-flattery and self-exaltation. They're excessively concerned with what other people think of them. They're excessively concerned with appearances and what everything looks like. We shouldn't be concerned with appearances. We should be concerned with what God thinks. Stop worrying about what everybody around you in your life thinks. Stop worrying about what humans think of you. Worry about what God thinks of you. Because His opinion is the only one that matters when it's all said and done. Stop craving the approval of men. Start craving the approval of God. You know, some people are like that even to... Some people, you meet people in churches like that even. They crave the approval of, you know, their religious friends around them. And they do things to fit in in whatever congregation they're in. Or do things to appease their, you know, their... The, the more pharisaical brethren, if you will. Who cares what they think? Care about what God thinks. That's the only person whose opinion matters. The only person. If you're, if you're trying to please somebody that's not God, you've got it backwards. You're missing the point. Don't exalt yourself in the eyes of men. Humble yourself in the eyes of men so that God, the true Lord of the banquet and the true host of the feast, He will exalt you. Okay, well, let's look at the other side of this picture, though. What if you're giving the party? Who do you invite? Who do you invite to this feast that we will put forth? Well, in verses 12 through 14, Jesus addresses this as well. He went on to say to the one who had invited him, When you give a luncheon or a dinner, do not invite your friends or your brothers or your relatives or your rich neighbors, otherwise they may also invite you in return, and that will be your repayment. But when you give a reception, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed, since they do not have the means to repay you, for you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. Yeah. Perhaps, you know, perhaps some people get left out. You know, the tendency is if you've got to limit your guest list, limit it to the people who can invite you back, who can return the favor, who can give you something extra that you want. The natural human inclination whenever you give any kind of feast is to invite your friends, your neighbors, and some of the rich people you want to rub elbows with because, you know, it's really good to be friends with those people. They help you out. And it's still tr that, that one is still true today. You know, people, people, don't like to, people don't like to be given favors because they feel like they're expected to give a favor in return. And most of the people that we invite into our homes to eat, well, they tend to be the people we know, don't they? Um, now, I don't think that there's anything wrong with spending time with friends and family, per se. No, absolutely not. But when the Bible talks about hospitality, it's talking about the treatment of strangers, don't confuse having your friends and family over with hospitality. Hospitality involves people you don't know. It involves giving feeding and lodging to strangers, not your best friend. That's, something that, that's what the Bible means when it talks about hospitality. Hebrews chapter 13 gives a perfect example of that. When it says in Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 2, Do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers, for by this some have entertained angels without knowing it. What's the point of that? Well, the point is that, you know, yeah, you can invite your friends and neighbors over, but that doesn't necessarily give you credit with God. In Luke chapter 6, Jesus made a similar point. In Luke chapter 6, in verse 32, He said, if you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners love those who love them. If you do good to those who do good to you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners do the same. If you lend to those from whom you expect to receive, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners in order to receive back the same amount. But love your enemies and do good to the and do good and lend expecting nothing in return, and your reward will be great, and you will be sons of the Most High, for he himself is kind to ungrateful and evil men. Be merciful just as your father is merciful. Luke chapter six, verses thirty-two through thirty-six. Jesus recommends inviting the poor and the crippled and the lame and the blind. Jesus recommends taking one-way relationships that have no reciprocity to them. The problem with inviting all these, you know, these rich people and these friendly people is that they can return the favor. So you're not really being selfless. You're not really concerned for others if you do good to them. 
No! If you're looking for reciprocity, you're not really doing good. The repayment that we should be interested in is eternal reward in heaven. We ought to store up for ourselves treasures in heaven. Not temporal benefits from our friends. Jesus recommends inviting those who don't have the means to repay. The one-way relationships. Now from the human perspective, that's a waste of effort. You might as well throw money away. Now how many, how many, how many of you have ever been in that situation? You know, where it's, you know, you give money to somebody and you know you're never going to see it back. Yeah, man, I just threw that away. You know, they're probably going to spend it on something that's bad. So, what were you going to do with it? I mean, you know, more to the point, before men, that is a waste. Before God, it's never a waste. Generosity towards others who can't repay you, that's not a waste before God. That's something that the Lord loves because it's something that He does constantly. The Lord is generous to those who have no means to repay Him. He's generous to you. He's generous to me. He gives great things to all of us. And is it too much to ask that we do the same to others? That we give to those who are incapable of repaying us? From the divine perspective, that's an eternal investment and it repays us in the resurrection. The Lord doesn't do it because He's going to... The Lord didn't save us because He was going to get something out of the deal. He didn't save us because, you know, well, we had some secret thing that He wanted that He can't get without us. The Lord does not need us. But He chose to save us because He loves us. That needs to be our outlook towards other people. A third parable, we might ask, after we've invited everybody, who's going to come to this feast? Well, in verse 15, one of the people who was reclining at the table with them heard this and said, Blessed is everyone who will eat bread in the kingdom of God. Don't you just love it when people interrupt Jesus and stick their own commentary in there? And almost every time it happens, Jesus says, Actually, you got it wrong. Um, you know, and that, that, that was the case back in chapter 11 when somebody said, Oh, blessed is the womb that bore you and the breast at which you nursed. And Jesus said, On the contrary, blessed are those who hear the word of God and keep it. It's the same thing here. In verse 16, he said to them, A man was giving a big dinner, and he invited many. And at the dinner hour, he sent a slave to say to those who had been invited, Come, for everything is ready now. But they all alike began to make excuses. The first one said to him, I bought a piece of land, and I need to go out and look at it. Please consider me excused. Another one said, I, I bought five yoke of oxen, and I'm going to go try them out. Please consider me excused. Another one said, I married a wife. And for that reason, I cannot come. And the slave came back and reported this to his master. And then the head of the household became angry and said to his slave, Go out at once into the streets and lanes of the city and bring in here the poor and crippled and blind and lame. And the slave said, Master, what you've commanded has been done and still there is room. And the master said to the slave, Go out into the highways and along the hedges and compel them to come in so that my house may be filled. For I tell you, not one of those men who are invited shall taste of my dinner. There's a longer version of this parable in Matthew 22, uh, and include, which includes a dispute about wedding clothes. We won't uh, get into that this morning, but there's a... I mean, what's going on in this parable? Man gives a big dinner. People give various excuses. Um, you know, acquired land they haven't inspected, acquired oxen they haven't used, acquired a wife that they haven't expected or used up to that point. And the master becomes angry, and he disinvites his friends. He cancels their invitation. Instead, he invites the poor and the crippled and the blind and the lame. That's Jesus' recommendation from verse 13. You know, the poor, the crippled, and the blind and the lame. And they may not be able to repay you, but, you know, they're probably not going to make excuses when it's time to come out and eat, right? And then there's still room. And the master insisted, my house is going to be filled. I don't want a single one of the original invitees to taste my dinner because they all made excuses. They all tried to get out of it. They didn't want to spend time with me. I don't want them either. They're gone. Well, what does this parable mean? Well, the man giving the dinner is obviously God. Those rejecting the initial invitation are probably the Jewish people around Jesus' day. Those being newly invited are the Gentiles. This is an offensive parable. It's designed to undo Jewish notions of superiority. Because the man at the table in verse 15 who says, Oh, blessed is everyone who eats bread in the kingdom of God. He's, 
you know, he's got this picture of what the kingdom of God is. His picture of the kingdom of God is Jewish superiority. We're all going to get to the table. We're all going to dine at the table. We're going to be special. And Jesus says, that's not the way it's going to work. He says, the Lord's going to fill his house. And some of you have rejected the invite and you're not getting in. And the Lord's going to take people who were not initially invited and bring them into the picture. It's like the prophet Zephaniah wrote in Zephaniah 3.19, I'm going to deal at that time with all your oppressors. I will save the lame, I will gather the outcast, and I will turn their shame into praise and renown in all the earth. Now, I mean, we can make a number of points from these parables about the feasts, about humility, how Jesus occupied the lowest place for our benefit. And we should strive to humble ourselves and be servants to others. And me first attitude has no place among Christians. We could talk about compassion, how Jesus is the ultimate example of giving to those who can't give back. And we should likewise give to others who cannot repay us. We should strive to see others as Jesus sees them. Not as people ripe for exploitation, but as souls that need saving. And more humility. God invites us to participate in a great feast. Why would we make excuses? Why would we spurn that invitation? Why would we sell our souls for passing fleeting secular concerns? We should not be arrogant as if salvation were somehow owed to us. Because it is not owed to us. It is something that we are given as an eternal gift by God's grace. And all those lessons, I think, teach us something about how our character ought to imitate God's character. Everything that God has done is something that we need to imitate in our dealings with others. But if that's true, then Christianity is costly. Why? Because it cost God something. In verse 25, the large crowds were going along with him. And he turned and said to them, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not carry his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Now to some people, that sounds unreasonable. This is not the first time Jesus has made a demand like this. A demand of discipleship that you can't even look back for the kingdom. In chapter 9, he said that anyone who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is not fit for the kingdom of God. That's scary. Must hate father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters and even life. Now, this is an example of how Luke records harsher versions of the statements that Jesus makes. Matthew, in Matthew 10, verse 37, for instance, says that he who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. But Luke, well, Luke quotes Jesus, in, and this is probably a different scene altogether, but it's the same fundamental point with a harsher language. You must hate father and mother. Now, on the one hand, you know, a literal approach to Jesus' words probably doesn't work here because... You know, I mean, Jesus does expect you to honor father and mother. He says as much in Mark chapter 7 and Matthew chapter 15. But on the other hand, I have to say, I think we need to be careful about some of these attempts that are out there to take the sting out of what Jesus is really saying. You know, it's frequently, you'll hear people say, well, hate just really means to love less. You know, blah, 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 blah. The opposite of hate's really, well, the opposite of love is really apathy. It's not hate. That's not true, by the way. The opposite of love is hate pretty clear in the Bible that the opposite of love is hate. I don't know where we learned antonyms, but uh, that's the case here. Um, <laughs> that said, you know, I wouldn't say a literal interpretation is correct, but I think we need to be very careful about knee-jerking to just soften the blow of what Jesus is saying. We're supposed, to feel, we're supposed to feel the impact of that. Because compared to our love for Christ, all other relationships ought to look like hate. Love and hate aren't matters of degrees. They are diametrically opposed to each other. And when we choose between the love of... If it comes down to a choice, we choose between the love of our family and the love of Christ. I hate my family. I'm going to choose Christ. That's the decision that we need to think about. That is the kind of mindset that we must have. Abraham? Abraham was commended because he showed loyalty and obedience to God. When God told him, I want you to sacrifice your only son whom you loved. We don't see any record of Abraham hesitating. He took his son out. He, was a, he, would have, he would have slain him. The knife was in his hand. The Lord stopped him because he said, Now I know that you love me above all, that you have faith in me above all. That, is, that, that story does not sit well with people because we don't want to stomach the idea that God has true top priority in our lives, not family. 
The law of Moses, you know, people, people have a hard time with this idea too. The law of Moses actually instructs family members to rat each other out for idolatry. If someone in your family or your close friend comes to you and says, Hey, let's go serve other gods. You know what you're supposed to do? You're supposed to tell the authorities about it and, there's, and the authorities will gather together and stone them to death. That's what Deuteronomy 13 and verses 6 through 11 says. That's scary. That command doesn't sit well with people. Because, I mean, for one thing, in our society, tattling is one of the few things that people think is actually wrong. I don't understand that. You know, how doing something wrong is not wrong, but telling other people about it is wrong. That doesn't seem messed up. The Bible nowhere condemns tattling. I think that it's funny that we've made that the, the ultimate carnal sin in today's world. But in the second place, the sheer brutality of that law, the idea that you ought to stone family members, that's... The lack of family loyalty, we see that as just totally counterintuitive to the way any of us think. It's the way that God wants us to think. Really think about that for a second. Your loyalty is not to your family. It's to the God of heaven who made you and who gave you that family in the first place. It's inherent in the Old Testament command. You shall have no other gods before me. Now, you know, we think of that in terms of idols. We think of that in terms of Baal or Zeus or Asherah or whatever. But are there some people who've made their children gods in their lives? You ever been to a house and that child was clearly the god in that home? That child ruled that home with an iron fist? You ever been to a house where, you know, it's the parents are god in that house, not God? Pleasing others is more important than pleasing God in that life. Well, we just talked about why pleasing others isn't really our goal, is it? It's pleasing the Lord that should be our goal. Pleasing our children? Not my goal in life. My goal in life is not for my children to be happy. My goal in life is for my children to love the Lord. And ultimately to love the Lord more than they love me. I should hope so. I ought to love the Lord more than I love them. Because the Lord is the top priority. He's the one who gave me the children in the first place. He is the source of all life. How many people, when it talks about your own life, well, their own life is really their God in their life. I want to do things my way. I want to pursue my dreams, my passions, my career, my, my way of doing things. I don't care what the Lord says. I'm going to do it my way. My favorite activities. Me. Well, it's not me first. It's God first. You know, and I, I want to be careful. I mean, because I say put God first. The people hear the phrase, put God first. I think a lot of us think of, and maybe I'm just projecting here, I think a lot of us think the way a child thinks when they're told, you have to eat your vegetables first. No, no child likes to eat their vegetables, you know, unless they're weird or something. But, uh, you know, no. It, it, when a parent tells your child, eat your vegetables first, you know, a child thinks, that, oh, no, I want to get, get to the good stuff. That's the way people think when they hear, put God first. Oh, fine, that's the boring chore I have to do and get out of the way before I can have the desserty things that I really like to eat. Putting God first is not some obligatory chore. God is, the, God is not the first of a million items on a checklist of stuff we've got to do. God is the only item on the list. He is the only item on that checklist. If I choose to have a wife and family, it is ultimately with the higher aim of pleasing the Lord. If I choose to be involved in any activity or job or hobby of any kind, it is ultimately with the aim of bringing glory to the Lord. In short, nothing is to be done unless it is in the name of the Lord Jesus. Colossians 3.17 Whatever you do, whether it's in word or in deed, all is to be done in the name of the Lord Jesus. All. And that hard instruction means we take up the cross. Verse 27, whoever does not carry his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. That's a hard, hard instruction. One that we've seen before in chapter 9. Is Jesus calling on us? To, is Jesus asking too much when he says, forsake family for me? Well, in the strictest sense, what he's saying is, if you don't forsake family for me, you can't be my disciple. That's true. There's no half-hearted commitment when it comes to Jesus. Look at what He left for us. He left the throne of glory and in heaven. He left the presence of His Father, although in obedience to His will. And the Father allowed the Son to go to the cross. There's a very real sense in which the Father and the Son forsake each other in order for us to be saved. How much more are we called to follow that pattern? To be a disciple of Jesus, He is asking for everything that you have. And if that sounds unreasonable, know this, it is no more than what He already gave. 
Of course, that cost is too much for some. In verse 28, he asks a question. He gives a series of examples about this. Which one of you, when he wants to build a tower, does not first sit down and calculate the cost to see if he has enough to complete it? Otherwise, when he has laid a foundation and is not able to finish, all who observe it begin to ridicule him, saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king, when he sets out to meet another king in battle, will not first sit down and consider whether he is strong enough with 10,000 men to encounter the one coming against him with 20,000? Or else, while the other is still far away, he sends a delegation and asks for terms of peace. So then none of you can be my disciple who does not give up all his own possessions. Jesus has a lot of professing disciples. Jesus has a lot of people who say, oh, I'm a Christian. There's a lot of people out there that say that. But that's not what discipleship is. It's not about wearing a name. It's about living it. And for some, it's trendy to have a Jesus fish on the car or the cross around the neck or a bumper sticker expressing one's theology. I'm not going to tell you what to do with those things. Those are personal, devotional expressions. You leave them to your will. You want to do those things, that's fine. But consider this. What does discipleship cost you? Well, it costs you everything you have. Jesus just said what it costs you. It's going to cost you your family. It's going to cost you your money. It's going to cost you your home. It's going to cost you your life. You may not die. You may not be specifically martyred for the cause of Christianity, but it will cost you your life. You're giving your life to God, and you're going to follow Him, and you're going to devote your life to Him. If you want to be Jesus' disciple... And you know, there's a lot of Christians, professing Christians, who don't make it. And the reason why is because they don't count the cost. They don't consider what it's going to cost them. And they get in a little bit, and it gets difficult, and... I didn't know I was signing up for this! Yes, you did. If you knew what the gospel was of a crucified Christ, you knew up front you were going to have to crucify yourself. And crucifixion is not fun. It's painful. You can crucify yourself. Don't be surprised. And you have to suffer in life a little bit. Jesus uses two examples. A man builds a tower and doesn't get estimates first. And he fails to complete the task and everybody ridicules him. I know a real life example of this. Uh, there's, a, there's a building like a mile away from where I grew up. Uh, it's the Majesty Building. And of all things, it was funded by the Tele-Evangelist Network. It's the real irony. You can see it when you drive on I-4 through Orlando, the north part of Orlando. You can see it from the highway. It's this big glass building. There's nothing underneath that glass but concrete. They never finished that building because they ran out of money, because they didn't count the cost ahead of time. And they're the ridicule of everyone around them. We call it the, what we, we jokingly refer to it as the I4 eyesore because that's what it is. It's not finished. The ridicule of everyone around them. But what about a man planning a battle and he doesn't think, oh, you know, he doesn't, he doesn't really think through his military strategy. He doesn't count his troops up. He doesn't realize, wait a second, I only got half the troops needed to defeat this other guy. The battle's not going to end very well. Unless it's one of those Old Testament battles where the Lord tells you, I want you to reduce the size of your army and fight anyway. Hey, you're probably not going to win with 10 against 20. It's not going to work. Failure to plan for battle results in humiliation and defeat. It's similar to the warning Jesus gave in chapter 12. Settle your dispute with your opponent before you go to trial. Because it's not in your favor. You will lose, and you will go to prison forever. <laughs> in verses 34 and 35, he talks about saltless salt. That's kind of a contradiction. Salt is good, but even if salt has become tasteless, with what will it be seasoned? It is useless either for the soil or for the manure pile. It is thrown out. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. What in the world is Jesus talking about here? All three of the Gospels have salt of the earth comments, and you know, they're making a little bit of a different point with their contexts, but I mean, basically... You know, the fundamental idea underlying all of it is this. Salt was a preservative in the ancient world. They didn't have refrigerators. They didn't have Freon. So they used salt to preserve their meat. Um, in India, they use spices to make their meat have flavor even after it's gotten old. And so that's why all of the food over there is very spicy. Uh, but salt was a way of preserving the meat. There's also a symbol of permanence as a result of that. But at the same time, it's a war there's a warning here. If salt loses its flavor... It's worthless. Can anything, I mean, can something tasteless be eaten without salt? Is there any taste in the white of an egg, as Job said in Job chapter 6, verse 6? It's worthless. Salt that's not salty is like dirt. You want dirt on your food? I don't. <laughs> the idea of salt losing its flavor is a funny one because, you know, chemically that's not really possible. Salt is salt. Uh, the only way you can make it not 
have, be salty flavor is if it's not salt anymore. If it's transformed into something that is not salt. So Jesus is really describing something that should never happen. It shouldn't happen. Our relationship with God ought to change us and who we are. We don't change back. It raises a question, I think. The loss of flavor in a Christian raises a question. Were you ever salt to begin with? Did you really understand what you were getting into when you joined the cause of Christ? In short, did you count the cost? But, I've been saying that Christianity is a costly enterprise. I want to say something else. It's all a matter of perspective. Because on the one hand, being a disciple of Jesus is going to cost you everything you presently have. You can't keep anything for yourself or you aren't really following Jesus. Your identity will be destroyed. It will be swallowed up. You know, the reason baptism is so important has a lot to do with this idea of being immersed or enveloped in Christ. So enveloped and immersed in Christ, drowned in Christ, proverbially, that there is no part of your former self that is left. It costs you everything you have. But on the other hand, being a disciple of Jesus is ultimately profitable in the long term. Why? Paul saw it this way in Philippians chapter 3. In verses 7 through 11. Whatever things were gained to me, those things I've counted as lost for the sake of Christ. More than that, I count all things to be lost in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them but rubbish, so that I may gain Christ, and may be found in Him, not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith, that I may know Him, and the power of His resurrection and the fellowship of His sufferings being conformed to His death in order that I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. Here's the, here's the truth. Yes, there's a big cost, but it's totally worth it. Because whatever you give up for following Christ, I guarantee you, what you get by knowing Christ is worth a lot more. Dying with Christ is worth it when weighed against the value of being raised with Christ. Why? And really, we shouldn't have to be told that, should we? Why would Jesus advertise himself this way unless he had something great to offer? Something so much greater than anything in the world. Something so much better than family can give us. Something so much better than career can give us. Something so much better than the world can give us is what Christ can give us. Instead of living for blood relatives in the flesh, we should become part of those related by the blood of Christ. Perhaps you're here this morning and you are not devoted to Christ in the way you ought to be. Perhaps you have never been immersed for the forgiveness of sins. Or perhaps you have been immersed and you've lost your way. And you realize that devoting yourself to the Lord is something that you need to do more fully. Perhaps you didn't count the cost and you're counting it now and you realize that the cost of not following Jesus is ultimately greater than the cost of following Him. Whatever you need to do this morning, make your life right with the Lord while we stand and while we sing.